All right. Thank you for coming out today. It's a real honor uh, to have our speaker uh, here today, Jason Riley. I want to tell you a little bit about how I came across Jason Riley, maybe the same way many of you did who are, who are here today. Uh, one way I came across him was I am a huge fan of Thomas Sowell, the economist Thomas Sowell, yeah. And uh, what I often do late at night after a, a day at the office and a day of my own writing, I like to many times just uh, get in my, uh, in my uh, chair in my living room and pull up YouTube and start watching some Thomas Sowell videos. And I go down to the Thomas Sowell rabbit hole. Maybe some of you have done that. And, uh, and just an amazing mind. And as I was doing that, I came across Jason Riley on Reason TV with Nick Gillespie. And he was speaking about Thomas Sowell. And then, and then pretty soon after that, had a, had a book coming out. And then now it's published called Maverick on Thomas Sowell. So then I, I listened to the podcast that Jason Riley was on. I listened to uh, Econ Talk with Russ Roberts. And I, I listened to Uncommon Knowledge with Peter Robinson and other podcasts. And Rob and I were talking for the Entrepreneurial Leadership Institute and for Global Entrepreneurship Week about bringing a, a very well-known and deep-thinking national speaker. And I said, we, we should really look at uh, Jason Riley. And Rob agreed. And we're very honored to have Jason here. So with that, I want to give you a little bit of background on Jason. Uh, Jason Riley is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, where he has written about politics, economics, education, immigration, and social inequality for more than 25 years. He's also a frequent speaker and provides commentary for television and radio news outlets. After joining the journal in 1994, he was named a senior editorial page writer in 2000 and a member of the editorial board in 2005. He joined the Manhattan Institute, a public policy think tank focused on urban issues in 2015. Riley is the author of five books. In 2008, he published Let Them In, which argues for a more free market oriented US immigration system. His second book, Please Stop Helping Us, which is about government efforts to help the black underclass, was published in 2014. In 2017, he published False Black Power, an assessment of why black political success has not translated into more economic advancement. In 2021, he published Maverick, a biography of the iconic economist and social theorist Thomas Sowell, and narrated the documentary film, Thomas Sowell, Common Sense in a Senseless World. He currently lives in suburban New York City. With that, it's an honor to invite Jason Riley to speak to Ball State University. Well, thank you for that, uh, that very kind introduction. Um, I also want to thank Ball State uh, for inviting me. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, I did a fair amount of speaking on, on college campuses, uh, when they let me uh, speak on college campuses, that is. And I'm, I'm only half uh, kidding. Some years back, a uh, school in Virginia invited me to give one of their annual uh, lectures. And two weeks later, they disinvited me. Um, I wrote a column about it. They got a lot of bad publicity, and so they reinvited me. Uh, so this is where we are today. Uh, I know better than to take these invitations for granted um, at a time when colleges and universities seem to be getting more and more intellectually intolerant. It's good to know that we still have places like Ball State that understand the role of college and the purpose of, of higher education. Um, uh, to say that higher ed has lost its way in recent years, I think, would be a huge understatement. When it takes Harvard's president three attempts and counting to condemn terrorist attacks in Israel in no uncertain terms, you know something is wrong on college campuses. When the University of Pennsylvania's president announces that the school's position on anti-Semitism needs clarification, you know that something has gone wrong on college campuses. When Jewish students are being physically assaulted and barricading themselves in school libraries to avoid being attacked by mobs of fellow students, you know something is very wrong on college campuses. And why shouldn't students be behaving this way? Look at how the adults on campus behave. Earlier this year, a federal judge was invited to speak to law students at Stanford University, one of the most prestigious law schools in the country. Protesters shouted him down. 
he was not allowed to finish his speech. They wanted to silence him, not debate him or critique him, but silence him. And they did so with the help of a school dean who was present at the event and sided with the protesters. Again, this is where we are today. Some years back, the University of Chicago began sending out letters to incoming freshmen that explain the school's commitment to academic freedom and how it does not support trigger warnings or safe spaces or cancel invited speakers because their topics might prove controversial. That used to go without saying on college campuses. Now it needs to be stated explicitly in writing to incoming students, which says something about where we are today. I think college ought to be a place where students are exposed to different points of view, where their sensibilities are challenged, where they learn to grapple with alternative perspectives and formulate coherent responses. College should be a place where you learn the difference between a slogan and an argument. On a lot of campuses, that's not happening, or at least it's not happening to the extent that it should be. All of which makes programs like this one not only important, but essential in today's environment. And again, I am honored to be here. I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about social and economic inequality. And I want to do so in the context of this social justice debate we've been having in the country. Social justice is, of course, all the rage today. It drives our discussions of everything from tax rates to student loan forgiveness to policing welfare state spending, K through 12 curriculum, and much, much more. In recent years, the progressive left in America has been ascendant in our politics, and advocates push for social justice in the name of addressing this inequality. What I'd like to do, however, is to challenge the premise of this discussion. And I'd like to do that by drawing from the writings of Thomas Sowell. For those who are unfamiliar with him, Sol is an economist by training, specializing in the history of economic thought and the history of ideas. But he's also a sociologist, a political philosopher, and a social theorist. He taught economics at several universities in the 1960s and 70s, including Amherst and Cornell and UCLA. And in 1980, he joined the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, where he remains. Among his many books, Sowell says his favorite is one titled A Conflict of Visions. It's a book about the history of ideas. He tries to explain what drives our ideological disputes about freedom and equality and justice. And he traces these disagreements back at least two centuries. To thinkers such as the British journalist William Godwin and philosophers such as Immanuel Kant and Jean-Jacques Rousseau down through John Rawls and the social justice advocates today. The conflicting or contrasting visions he describes in the book are the constrained, the tragic view of human nature, and the unconstrained, or more utopian view. People with a more constrained view of the human condition see mankind as hopelessly flawed. They see inherent limits to human betterment. We might want to end war, poverty, or racism, for example, but that's probably not going to happen, they reason. Therefore, our focus should be on putting in place institutions and processes that help society deal with problems we're probably never going to fully solve. On the other side, you have this unconstrained or utopian view of human nature, which basically rejects the idea that there are any limits to what humans can achieve. This is the belief that nothing is unattainable. And moreover, no trade-offs are necessary. Everything is available to all who want it. According to this perspective, through the proper amount of reason and willpower, we can not only manage problems like inequality and discrimination, but solve them entirely. In a conflict of vision, Sowell argues that depending on which view you embrace, there are a whole host of public policies you are likely to support or oppose. The book explains why two people, similarly well-informed, 
similarly well-meaning. We'll reach opposite conclusions, not just on a given issue, but on a whole range of issues. Taxes, rent control, school choice, military spending, judicial activism, and so forth. When Immanuel Kant said that from the crooked timber of humanity, no truly straight thing can ever be made, he was exhibiting this constrained view. But when Rousseau said that man is born free, but everywhere in chains, he was voicing the unconstrained view. When Oliver Wendell Holmes, a Supreme Court justice in the early 1900s, said that as a judge, his job was to make sure the game is played according to the rules, whether he liked them or not. It was the constrained view. But when Earl Warren, a Supreme Court justice in the 1950s and 60s, said that his job as a judge was to do what he thinks is right, regardless of the law, it was the unconstrained view. A conflict of visions is part of an informal trilogy by Soul on the history of ideas it's published over a 12-year period. And the third book in that trilogy is titled The Quest for Cosmic Justice, which is the main source of these remarks. Cosmic justice, as Sol is using the phrase, is a form of social justice. And social justice advocacy springs from that unconstrained view of human nature, where there are no limits to human betterment and no trade-offs in addressing inequality. Before going any further, I'd like to back up and say a couple things about the premise of the social justice debate. And the first thing I want to stress is that social justice and traditional justice are two very different concepts. And social justice advocates have attempted to re redefine what is commonly understood when we talk about justice and fairness. Traditional justice is about ensuring an impartial process it's not about guaranteeing certain results. A defendant in a criminal case has received justice if the trial is conducted under fair rules with an impartial judge and jury, regardless of whether the outcome is guilty or not guilty. A basketball game is considered fair if everyone plays by the same rules, regardless of who wins. Social justice is closer to the opposite of this. Rules and standards can be set aside in hopes of achieving certain results. And the larger ramifications for society, that is the trade-offs, are downplayed or even ignored. Think about a university admissions process that has one set of criteria for black applicants and a different set for white applicants. What matters must, most to the social justice advocates is the outcome, not the process. In fact, to the social justice advocate, the process should be rigged, if necessary, to achieve the desired result, such as more racial balance on campus, even if that means discriminating against certain groups to get that desired outcome. Now, this is not simply a question of semantics. The social justice advocates bring an almost utopian mindset to these issues of social and economic equality. Their presumption is that equal outcomes, or something approaching equal outcomes, is the norm in society. And that where we don't find it, something nefarious must be going on. This is not to say that we shouldn't be bothered by inequality. We should be, and most of us are. But the goal is to understand why it persists, even though no one finds it desirable. And the reason inequality continues to persist is because it is the norm. It's not the exception. Disparities, gaps, inequities are not always strange or sinister. They're natural and they're widespread. They exist in all kinds of human endeavors, all around the world and down through history. Yes, discrimination and exploitation also exist and they can worsen inequality. But they hardly explain these disparate outcomes, which exist even among groups of the same race and ethnicity. 
The reality is that different groups often have different cultures, different behaviors, different attitudes and habits, which is why people don't tend to advance at the same rate, not within countries and not between countries, not historically and not currently. Nor is there any guarantee that a group that has advanced will necessarily stay advanced. In a previous era, China was the most advanced society on the planet. Later, it would be the Middle East, then Europe, then America. The ancient Greeks and Romans were far more advanced than their British and Scandinavian contemporaries. Just a few generations ago, Japan was poorer than any country in Western Europe. Today, Japan is wealthier than any country in Western Europe. Again, these disparities exist not only between countries, but within the countries. People in isolated, mountainous regions tend to lag behind people from the lowlands. People who live on coast tend to be more advanced than people who live inland. It doesn't matter whether these people are of the same race or different races. The bottom line is that disparities are commonplace. Yet we continue to have a debate about inequality that treats these differences as weird or otherworldly. Scholars who have studied societies down through history have never found this evenness in group advancement that social justice advocates tell us is normal and that would exist today if it weren't for racism or discrimination or exploitation. Progressives expect to see equal representation among groups in test scores and graduation rates, professional occupations, criminal behavior, income levels, but they can't point to a single society where this has ever happened. It's utopian. Whatever the reasons behind these economic disparities, what's important to understand is that they've been common throughout history. Today, Japan is twice as rich as Canada. India's GDP is three times that of Switzerland. Sub-Saharan Africa's GDP is less than a tenth of Europe's. Some people have suggested that this world inequality exists because some countries were able to take advantage of the Industrial Revolution, while others could not. One problem with that explanation is that inequalities among nations did not begin with the Industrial Revolution, or with colonialism, for that matter, or with slavery. Some say Africa is poor because the West plundered it. But Africa was poor before the colonists arrived. It was poor while they were there, and it was poor after they left. In America, there have been calls for slavery reparations for blacks in the name of social justice and to address income inequality. Proponents say that slave labor made America rich. Well, it's true that some individual slave owners prospered due to slave labor. That's different from concluding that the entire country was made better off economically. Slavery in America was concentrated in the South, yet the South was the poorest region in the country, both during slavery and afterward. The same can be said of Brazil. Those regions of Brazil that had slavery were poorer, both during slavery and afterwards, than those regions of Brazil that had few, if any, slaves. And despite importing far more slaves than America, Brazil never became as prosperous as America. Eastern Europe had slavery far longer than Western Europe, yet Western Europe has always been richer. In fact, per capita income between Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans is larger than the black-white gap in America. On an even more basic level, it's important to keep in mind that people don't behave randomly. They behave with a purpose in mind. They don't immigrate randomly, choose jobs or neighborhoods to live in randomly, or raise their children randomly. Behavior differs between groups, whether you break it down by race, sex, religion, or in other ways. The way children are raised also differs greatly from one income level to another which can also perpetuate inequality. 
One study showed the children and families where the parents are professionals, doctors, lawyers, engineers, etc. Their children hear about 2,100 words per hour at home on average. Children whose parents are working class, auto mechanic, factory worker, hear about 1,200 words per hour. And children from poor families on welfare hear about 600 words per hour. Well, that may not seem like a huge difference. But what it means is that over time, a 10-year-old child from a family on welfare will not have heard as many words at home as a three-year-old child whose parents are professionals. Now think about how that statistic alone can affect life outcomes, how it can impact learning and job prospects down the road. You can't blame racism or prejudice for this sort of thing. And nothing the government can do will give the welfare child the same life chances as the child of professional parents. Let me use a personal example to illustrate the role of culture. Many years ago, before I joined the Wall Street Journal, I took a trip back home to Buffalo, New York, where I was born and raised. And I was visiting my older sister and chatting with her daughter, my niece, who was maybe in the second grade at the time. I was asking her about school, her favorite subjects, that sort of thing, when she stopped me and said, Uncle Jason, why you talk white? And she turned to her little friend who was there and she said, don't, don't my uncle sound white? Why, why are you trying to sound so smart? And she was just teasing, of course, and I smiled and they enjoyed a little chuckle at my expense. But what she said stayed with me. I couldn't help thinking, here were two young black girls, seven or eight years old, already linking speech patterns to race and intelligence. They already had a somewhat sophisticated awareness that as blacks, white sounding speech was not only to be avoided in their own speech, but mocked in the speech of others. Now, I shouldn't have been too surprised by this, and I wasn't. My siblings, along with countless other black friends and relatives, teased me the same way while I was growing up. And other prominent black professionals, from Barack and Michelle Obama on down, have told similar stories. It's not uncommon. What I'd forgotten is just how early these attitudes take hold, how soon this counterproductive thinking and behavior begins. New York City, where I'm based, has the largest school system in America. And around 80% black kids in New York City public schools are performing below grade level, 80%. And a big part of the problem is a black subculture that rejects attitudes and behaviors that are conducive to academic success. Black kids read half as many books and watch twice as much television as their white counterparts. In other words, a big part of the problem is a culture that produces little black girls and boys who are already worried about acting and sounding white by the time they are in the second grade. New York City's most selective public high schools release demographic data each year on who's admitted. And there is nothing resembling a random distribution of students by race or ethnicity when it comes to who gets into these schools. There are eight of them, and they admit students based on a single standardized exam. Every year, Asian students, who comprise about 15% of the city's public school system, are awarded more than half of all the slots. Asian students' outcomes that we see year after year in New York are not a result of luck or privilege they stem from hard work in a culture that prioritizes learning. Research shows that Asian kids read more books, watch less television, and study longer than other groups. In low-income Asian families, money goes toward test prep instead of $300 sneakers. And the results are obvious at elite schools, not just in New York, but nationwide. 
where even low-income Asian students outperform middle and upper income students from other groups. And we see it not only at our elite schools, but also at our elite colleges. We're having a debate about eliminating standardized tests in order to produce more racial balance, all in the name of social justice. Some claim the tests are racist. But if that's true, how is it that Asians, a racial minority group, gets the highest scores? The Asian experience also undermines efforts to use past discrimination as a blanket explanation for today's racial disparities. Black Americans obviously aren't the only people ever to be discriminated against in the US, though you might not know that from listening to some commentators. Chinese Americans were lynched. Japanese Americans were placed in internment camps during World War II. Asians in California were forced to attend separate schools, kept out of certain jobs, and not allowed to own land in some areas. Yet Asian Americans today outperform white Americans both academically and economically, and have for decades. And the story has been true among other racial and ethnic minority groups around the world, the ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia, Indians in Uganda, the Lebanese in West Africa, and of course, Jews all over the world are just a few examples of a racial or ethnic minority group outperforming the majority, either academically or economically or both, despite this being discriminated against in the past or even in the present. Let me offer one other example that undermines the argument made by social justice advocates that racism, by and large, explains racial inequality. And the example shows that even if we could, by some miracle, eradicate racism, it is by no means certain that that would have a huge impact on the economic well-being of most black people. In 2014, according to the Census Bureau, the poorest county in the US was located in Kentucky, and its population was 99% white. Median household income in this county was less than half of the white median nationwide. And it was thousands of dollars less than the black median nationwide. So here you had a subset of white America that for all intent and purposes, experiences no racism. Yet, their household incomes are not only dramatically lower than whites as a whole, but also significantly lower than blacks as a whole. Now that's not an argument for ignoring racism, but it does undermine the claim that racism is the main driver of racial disparities in income. Now none of this is to deny that racism exists or to deny that it can have a negative impact on upward mobility. It does exist, and it can have a negative impact. The question is not whether discrimination exists, but rather how much discrimination is impacting the underperforming minority group compared to other factors that are impacting these groups. Today, the belief in social justice as a moral imperative is all the rage, and it's jargon, white privilege, systemic racism, unconscious bias, has entered the media lexicon. But it's based on a shaky premise, which is that evenness in outcomes is the norm, and that where we don't find it, something fishy must be going on. My larger point is that inequality today between different racial and ethnic groups has less to do with discrimination and far more to do with different cultural attitudes and behaviors and habits. In a television interview many years ago, Thomas Sowell was asked why some groups in America do better than others. Let me read you his response. I would look at it differently, he said. I would say, and especially in the United States, I would say, why would we expect 
different groups to do the same. I say especially in the United States because there are very few indigenous Americans. Americans have come here from all over the world. And why would you ever expect that countries that had entirely different histories, located in entirely different climates, different geographies, why would you expect those countries to develop exactly the same mix of skills to exactly the same degree so that their people would arrive on these shores in such a way that they would be represented evenly across the board? Especially since even in countries where most of the population is indigenous, you don't find it there. Nowhere in the world do you find this evenness that people use as a norm. And I find it fascinating that they will hold up as a norm something that has never been seen on this planet and regard as an anomaly something that is seen in country after country after country. Again, this difference between social justice and traditional justice is not merely semantic. In the name of social justice, we've gotten all kinds of public policies that are not only unhelpful, but detrimental to the very groups social justice advocates are trying to help. The ever-growing welfare state is just one example. Bigger and bigger welfare programs are promoted in the name of social justice. They are promoted as a means of helping people trapped by misfortunes beyond their control. The problem is that the programs themselves have become traps. The median time a family spends in New York City in public housing is almost 20 years. Housing intended to help families through a rough patch has become a multi-generational trap. When the government sends people more money than they can earn working, they have an incentive not to work. Social justice advocates complain about increasing income disparities between those at the top and those at the bottom. But the welfare state itself contributes to these disparities by reducing the need for people at the bottom to earn income. Social justice advocates seem far more interested in redistributing wealth than in creating wealth. They seem far more interested in making the poor comfortable than in making the poor more productive. The lesson of the past 50 years ought to be that simply transferring cash and in-kind benefits and services to the poor does not make people more prosperous, simply makes them more dependent. It's also important to note the progress that was occurring, particularly among blacks, prior to the implementation of these programs designed to help them. Programs that often receive all the credit for any progress that we have seen. For example, between 1940 and 1960, black poverty in the US fell by 40 percentage points. That's before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's before the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's before Lyndon Johnson's Great Society welfare state expansions of the late 60s. It's before affirmative action. This was during Jim Crow. This was during a period of open, rampant, and legal racial discrimination in the US. Prior to the 1960s, in the first half of the 20th century, when black leaders and other leaders who wanted to help blacks were more focused on developing this human capital and less focused on seeking racial preferences, we saw racial gaps narrowing, narrowing in income, narrowing in criminal behavior, in educational attainment, in black representation in middle class professions, and in many other areas. Blacks were not only making gains in absolute terms, they were gaining on whites. But following the welfare state expansions of the 1960s and 70s, that previous progress slowed down, or stalled, or in some cases even reversed course. If we're going to have an honest debate about what drives inequality today, 
it has to include a discussion about behavioral differences among groups. And too many social justice advocates do not want to have that discussion. Downplaying those differences might seem like the charitable thing to do, but the relevant question is whether it is helpful. More than anything else, underperforming groups need the human capital, the values, the habits, the attitudes, the behaviors that facilitate economic advancement. To the extent that our politicians and policymakers and advocates pretend otherwise, they are not really addressing the underlying causes of inequality. Thank you. I think, um, I think we're gonna take some questions, okay. Thank you very much for being here. I really enjoyed your presentation. I do recall when I read your wonderful book on Tom Sowell, you said, and I think he said too, it's not a matter of constrained visions right, unconstrained visions wrong. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a little unconstrained vision is something even people like me could buy into. And, well, and there is some sense of that, that sometimes an unconstrained vision does give us hope, it gives us aspirations, and you recognize sure. that. Nor, nor should it be interpreted that someone with a constrained view um, has given up. That because we'll never uh, vanquish racism from society, we shouldn't care about it. N no, that is not, that's, that's not the argument, and I think so. So I would agree with that. It's also, uh, in, in the book, it's interesting that um, very few people are, uh, even when it comes to naming these, these, these thinkers of the past, these philosophers, economists, judges, and so forth, are completely consistent. Often among their views, you will get a little bit of unconstrained in a person who has a constrained view and vice versa. And so yeah, it's, it's hard to find someone who is so doctrinaires that, um, uh, that there's no inconsistency there. Questions? So my question is, in 2023, what is the biggest social unrest currently happening? I'm, I'm, I missed that, I'm sorry. Could you repeat so, that, please? So in 2023, um, what could you say the biggest social unrest is currently? I, I'm, Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to rank them, but I, I guess uh, in places where we see large numbers of people uh, suffering due to the actions of others, to the deliberate actions of others, you know, wars going on. Uh, you look at, you know, the hot spots in the world, it's Syria, it's the Middle East, it's, uh, 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 What's, what's, what's going on with the, uh, the Uyghurs in China, uh, what's going on in uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, a lot of uh, bad actors out there. And I, I guess what's really sad is they seem to be on the ascendant of late, um, whether it's North Korea or China or, um, or, or, or the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Sudan is flaring up again. Uh, uh, it, it'd be very hard to come up with a top, a top one. There are a lot of people suffering in a, a lot of different places and, and, and often needlessly that this is, um, these are man-made catastrophes. These are not inevitable. And, and so um, it's hard for me to pick one. No, number one, thank you for coming today. And it's to address uh, a topic like this, is, I, I appreciate you being willing to do that. <laughs> in an open forum these days, it's kind of interesting. Our Indiana's own Sage Steele, you know, made a comment a little while back that was just interpreted somewhat conservative and was suspended, you know, from her position at ESPN for a little while. So these are these are interesting times. But but thank you for being here. And uh, if I read your bio correctly, you're from the State University of New York, is where you got your education. Yes. So you are a testament to public education. <laughs> I've, I've been reading uh, you in the journal for some time, and and watch, you know watching you on television. And I just um, 
it's this gives me hope. Uh, well, thank having, you. Having you here and speaking about this, uh, I'm an optimist. I cheer for meritocracy. So, uh, God willing, it'll make a comeback here sometime soon. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, just to follow up on that, the, I, I find the assault on meritocracy um, especially disturbing and, 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 and sad, especially that it's being made by people who want to address inequality. Um, eliminating standardized tests is not going to eliminate the achievement gap only going to further obscure the achievement gap. Uh, that gap is going to show up somewhere else in that child's life. If it's not uh, on the SAT score, perhaps it's going to be on the LSAT or the medical boards, or it's going to be when they go to take the test to become a fireman or a police officer. Uh, it's going to show up. Uh, and if you want to help someone, you need to know where they are because they can only get where you want them to go from where they are, not from where you hope they will be, pray they will be. And that standardized test is simply telling you where they are. Uh, so the idea that, 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 that someone would want to get rid of testing to, uh, to, to reduce inequality, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. And the meritocratic systems that we have are not perfect. But it's like Churchill said about democracy. It's the best thing or the worst thing except for all the other options you have. Do you want to go back to a system of nepotism instead of meritocracy? The old boys network instead of meritocracy? I mean, no. I think um, uh, we, we'd rather stick with meritocracy. So I, I am, I am um, deeply, deeply disturbed by this war on, on, on meritocracy that we see going on, and it seems to be escalating. Hi, I had a question. Um, you said that you weren't an advocate for reparations, but we as black individuals were promised reparations 40 years and a mule, and we would never receive them, and black people still systematically are left out of America's economic growth development with redlining and et cetera. So I was just curious and you also use the example of Japanese internment camps, but failed to mention that Japanese prisoners who were interned also receive reparations at the end of it. So I was just curious to why you don't think that black people or black Americans should receive reparations for slavery. I think that um, slaves should receive uh, reparations from slave owners. And if you can find me either of those people, I'd be happy to be for reparations people who were interned in Japanese camps that received reparations were interned in Japanese camps. The problem here is that all the slaves are dead and all the slave owners are dead. And that's the problem with reparations. In fact, it's even, I think, a more ridiculous concept because what you're really asking is that um, people who were never slaves receive reparations, not only from people who were never slave owners, but in the case of white Americans today, most white Americans aren't even descendants of slave owners. They're descendants of people who came to this country after slavery ended. So you want black people who were never slaves to receive reparations from the descendants of people who were never slave owners. And I, I think that's a ridiculous notion on its face. And I see no justification for it. But further than that, the question is, what do you think it would accomplish? The question is, you know, reparations at the end of the day amounts to another wealth redistribution scheme. We've tried that in this country. We've spent trillions and trillions of dollars over the past 50, 60, 70 years trying to redistribute wealth, sending out checks. The government is very, very good at it. It has not done what we were told it would do. And I have no confidence that yet another wealth redistribution scheme will be any more successful than the previous ones have been. 
Jason, I guess I will ask the last question here. Um, Arthur Schlesinger, the historian, used to say that society, the visions, would swing back and forth, and one would overcorrect, and then it would start to swing back. But we were talking before your talk that there are other things in place now, like social media and uh, news channels that stick to one view, and people tend to live in those areas. Do you think Schlesinger's observation, given your travels and, and what you see, uh, that that could be still going, could still happen? Or do you think that uh, it's a different time than when he was writing? That there could be a, a correction? Yeah. Uh, I, you, you have to think there will be a correction at some point. The, the, the question becomes, how far is the pendulum going to swing in one direction before the correction? And I, I, I don't think we're there yet, um, frankly. Um, you know, we're, we're living in a time when people are ripping down statues of Abraham Lincoln and erecting statues of George Floyd. Um, people who swam on the boys team last year are swimming on the girls team this year and you're not allowed to notice. Um, Math is racist. Punctuality is white supremacy. We're in a very bad way right now. Um, I'd like to think a correction is coming, um, but I'm not holding my breath right now, unfortunately. I, I hate to be <laughs> such a downer on these things. I do think it will come um, because I, I think that Americans will only stand for the small group of people who hold the views I just stated uh, getting to run the show. I don't think they represent the majority of, of this country, uh, of any race. And so I think um, they're on borrowed time to some, to some, to some degree, but right now they are ascendant, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a little disturbing. Thank you. We, we have a couple students who sure. have, okay. All right, cool. Um, thank you for coming out here. Um, I really enjoyed you speaking. And a lot of your points uh, really, um, what should I say, um, really refined my point of view. And uh, I think there's a lot of ignorance in a lot of our cultures, from black to white, Asian, all over the world. Um, and so my question is, is uh, what changes should we make in our institutions to explain or to expand the minds of young people, or should we not even have any changes at all? Uh, well, I think this goes to what what was just said. Um, I, I always encourage uh, people, but especially young people, to um, engage points of view you disagree with on a regular basis. Uh, for people of my generation, uh, we didn't have to sort of consciously try and do this. Uh, it was the way society ran. You know, I, I was saying earlier, I, I grew up with basically uh, three national news networks uh, giving me the news every night. Uh, you know, Dan, uh, Dan, Dan Rather, Tom Jennings, uh, Peter, Peter Jennings, and Tom Brokaw. Uh, and then we would, um, let, me, let me put it a different way. Um, I was told recently that David Letterman was uh, a graduate of, of this institution. Uh, when I was growing up, David Letterman was a popular uh, uh, night show host on television. And David Letterman would um, open his show with a monologue every night. And uh, just like Johnny Carson on another network would do it. And they would make jokes about the news of the day. Um, but I didn't get my news from David Letterman. I'd, I'd al I already knew what the news was, and I listened to him joke about it. But he wasn't my news source. I remember, and this didn't start recently, but I remember when Jon Stewart had a show. Um, I would talk to young people on college campuses, and I'd ask them, where do you get your news? 80% of them would say Jon Stewart. 
if you had asked me when I was 20 years old where I got my news, there's no way I would have ever said David Letterman. <laughs> so that's one of the generational differences that, 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 that you're dealing with. Um, uh, but the other thing, and this is really uh, an advent of social media, uh, or I should, I should say a function of social media, when I was your age, I didn't have the option of, of having a handheld device that would um, only reinforce my own biases about things on a constant basis every day, um, where I didn't have to engage this point of view or this point of view. I could just stick to what I was reading here and feel informed. Um, you have that option, and I, and I encourage people uh, to get out of that box. Um, I was saying earlier to someone, the problem is not the person who watches Fox News or the person who watches MSNBC. The problem is the person who only watches Fox News or the person who only watches MSNBC. Because if you try and have a conversation with that person, you two have nothing to talk about. You don't even know what the other person is talking about. You're just talking past one another. And, 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 and I think that's very much is driving a lot of the political divisions that we have in this country today. Uh, and the politicians are playing off of that. Um, and that's gotta, gotta be reversed. And I, the only way I think that is gonna be reversed is if people take it upon themselves to engage other points of view, to understand where other people are coming from. Um, uh, so that when you do have a conversation with them, uh, it's a much more informed conversation. And, and I think that's the place we wanna, that's the direction I'd like to head in. All right, one last question. So I believe you said your niece um, asked you a while back, why do you talk so white? And mm -hmm. I've, I've encountered similar situations where people will ask me, why do I sound the way I do, or, you know, based on my skin color. And I want to, how do you, I want to ask, how do you promote to a younger black generation that education isn't something that should be looked upon as white or anything bad in a sense. It's something that, you know, everybody should want to have a, a good education. How do you promote that? Well, in, in, my, in my case, you, you try and set an example. And that niece of mine is uh, not only a college graduate, she has a graduate degree. She's more educated than I am today. Uh, so you try and set an example. Maybe Uncle Jason who talks white had something to do with that. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but that, that's what, you, you, you want, um, you know, either uh, directly or indirectly, I think, to be role models, to be examples. You want those little kids out there to look at someone like you and go, I don't sound funny, I sound like this guy. Or I sound like that, or I sound like Uncle Jason. Uh, and I, I think that that is gonna change. What you're up against, you know, is a, um, and this is unfortunate, what you're up against is a perception among some people in society that the only authentic black person talks a certain way, behaves a certain way, has certain attitudes, holds certain political positions. And if they don't, they're not authentically black. And that's what, that's what you're up against. Um, and that's one of, one of the problems, that the thuggish black is the authentic black. The rest are pretenders or sellouts or so forth. And, and that's, what, that's what you're up against. But, um, um, I think, you know, a critical mass of, of, of people offering a different perspective, if only through their behavior, can make a big difference. And so I, I would just concentrate on <laughs> doing what you think is right and being an example to other people. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. And uh, the whole idea here is free thinking. Learn how to think for yourself. So get, develop some personal agency and, and see different points of view. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you.